no words in the English language nor any other language on this earth that can describe the greatness of God, the goodness of the Lord. We just don't have the vocabulary to describe that. You know, I do believe there's a heavenly language that could describe His greatness, but in this world, it's difficult to explain how wonderful He is and how good God is. But tonight, I want to, we've been talking about prayer for several weeks, and I don't know how far we'll get through this particular uh, message tonight, but I want to talk about uh, 10 roadblocks that are uh, responsible for unanswered prayer. There are roadblocks in our life. How many knows that can prevent prayers from being answered? How many knows that? And I will talk about, I don't know how far we'll get. I don't know if we'll get all 10 of them tonight or if we'll just get part of them. But uh, I want to welcome all those listening by way of live stream tonight, listening by uh, social media tonight. I trust that they will be blessed. If you have a prayer request, please leave it in the comment section. Please comment. Let us know that you're listening tonight, and we'll be praying for you as well. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew, book of Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. And if you'll go to, um, go to verse 9. We'll start here with the Lord's Prayer here. Matthew 6, 9 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14 and 15. 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Father, tonight, thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for all things that you've blessed us with, Lord. God, I ask you to anoint us to speak for you, God. Without this anointing, God, we cannot be effective tonight. We pray that ears would be touched and they would hear the gospel tonight. Lord, that lives will be forever changed. Lord, those listening, uh, Lord, by live stream would be touched as well. We're praying, Lord, that heaven would move, Lord, tonight. Every person in this place would be changed by the power and the authority of Almighty God. We ask these things in Christ Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Tonight, as we talk about these ten roadblocks that are responsible for unanswered prayer, how many of you honestly, and you don't even have to raise your hand, but how many of you honestly can say, why have my prayers not been answered? Or why does it seem like that I'm not getting through. It seems like something just doesn't seem to add up here. Now, I grant you that there are times when we have to be patient with God, and there are times when answered prayer is coming, but there are also times that unanswered prayer is a result of something on this end. When I worked for a, a public utility, I worked for an electric company, and one of the things that we found during storms uh, is when thousands of customers would be without electricity, it was normally a, a break in the line, a transformer, a fuse, something uh, that would cause several thousand customers to be off. But every now and then you'd get a call back after the power went on and there'd be a customer that at the, uh, they would call in and say, I, don't, I still don't have, all my neighbors have electricity but me. Why well, don't I have electricity? And we would send someone out to check it, and, and what would happen is in these isolated cases many times is there would be electricity from the power pole to the meter box to the house. The problem was not the power coming in, but the problem was at the, at the box. The problem was at the breaker box or the, the, the actual box where the meter was. There was a problem on the inside of the house. 
And so when there was a problem on the inside of the house, that was the customer's responsibility to call an electrician and have something fixed because it's like we're, you're getting power. It's just not coming inside your house because you have a problem inside your house. Oh, this will preach if you'll hear me. The problem is not God. He, the power's coming down. The power's getting to us. But the problem can be on the inside of the house. It can be inside us. We are the house of God. Correct? And so sometimes the reason there's no power is because it may be an issue, an inside issue. It could be a, a bad breaker. It could be a, a, a blown fuse. It could be a, a wire that is burning too. It could be, it could be a number of things. Um, and so there has to be an electrician called in to, to go into that house and to check all the, the inside to make sure. And once that's repaired, how many of the power is restored fully? Can you think of that in a sense of prayer? That if, if prayer is unanswered, there is this possibility that there could be a problem on the inside of us that could be interfering with the prayer itself. And so we'll talk about some of this tonight. Many times people will ask, why is it that I just cannot get my prayers through to God? Many of you may have already asked that question. Many of you have asked that question. Um, in, in, a, in a few minutes or a few moments, we're going to talk about 10 roadblocks that keep us from being effective uh, that we could be in our prayer life. So our prayer life gets hindered. It's not as effective when there's something wrong. But before I get there, I want to ask us to take a minute and just think about it. Do you know why a lot of prayers are not answered and they haven't received an answer from God? It's simply because we've not prayed. We've not asked. Now, I know that's elementary, but how many knows that can be a problem as well? I don't want to skip over the obvious because God's Word teaches us that we have not because why? Yes. We ask not. Jesus said, until you have asked, until you have asked in my name, you know, and then you'll receive it. You have to ask in His name. You have to believe God. You have to trust God is going to do it. I think sometimes we think as prayer is we save prayer for the big things. But how many of us, it's the little things that you really need to ask God to help you with. It's the little things. The big things can be pretty obvious. But it's the little things that we really need to touch God about. Because we can make a, a, a wrong turn or we can take a wrong... Uh, avenue. We can just we can do something outside of God's plan simply because it seems simple, and this is the way the mind thinks. This is the way the natural mind thinks is the simplest solution here, the simplest thing here, the problem here. So that's what you have to understand is is that when man's mind gets in it, when we get involved in it, how I many of us we have a tendency to do uh, do it our way or do it the way we think it needs to be done. Most of my prayers have never been answered. I, I wouldn't care to say all of them. Most of my prayers have not been answered exactly the way I wanted them answered. And everybody said amen. I've got a little ringing. Can you just take down? Just not much. Just touch it. And so we think about, uh, I want to talk about uh, right where we're living tonight. When you think about 10 roadblocks that keep us from hearing from God and receiving what we believe we need tonight. Um, the first one, a problem area in our prayer life. One of the first things I want to talk about tonight is a realization of unconfessed sin. Now notice I put realization in front of that. There is unconfessed sin that we may not know about. There is sin that there is possibly that we've offended and didn't know it. Possibly there's something that we did. We don't have a knowledge of it. We didn't know. But how many knows the thing we do know about, that's the problem. Somebody asked, um, I'll think of his name in just a minute. Uh, they asked him if, um, what he thought about the Bible, the parts that he didn't understand. Did that bother him? And he said, it's Mark Twain. He said, it's not the parts in the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts in the Bible I do understand that bother me. So, if there's realization of unconfessed sin, what that simply means is it's sin we know about. And we just 
really not taking it serious. Or we enjoy it or we like it. So we coddle it. We sort of, we sort of ag it on. And, and so this is what I'm talking about tonight. A realization of unconfessed sin. In Psalm 68, 18, it tells us if I regard wickedness in my heart or iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, this is what the psalm tells us. Now, there's a difference between just unconfessed sin and realization of unconfessed sin. There is a difference. We talked about that already. Unconfessed sin that we may have not knowledge of and then sin that we do have knowledge of but we don't do anything about it. So let's talk about that tonight. There's a difference. Psalm 66, 68, 18. The psalmist says, If I regard iniquity in my heart or wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The word regard here. Now, if we did a word study on the word regard here, could have many words substituted for it tonight. Let's say, if I cherish sin in my heart. Instead of the word regard, we could translate cherish. If I cherish the word or if I cherish the sin in my heart, I'm, I'm holding on to it. I like it. If, I, if the, the Lord will not hear me, if I fondle, if I tolerate, if I foster sin, the Lord will not hear my prayer. So if I'm encouraging that, if I'm, if I'm you know, it's, it's like a child. You tell them to give this up. It's not good for you. And they say, oh, I want to keep it anyway, you know. You got to. You can't keep that alligator anymore. <laughs> you know, Amen. you can't. You know, you, you just can't do this. You, it's something they don't want to give up, but they but it, it's they want to keep it. It's, it. And I was just being a little facetious there. But it's what I'm trying to say is there's things in our life I believe that we've grown accustomed to or that we've like maybe, and we don't want to give it up, and we don't want to let go of it, and so we foster it, we tolerate it. It gives us a picture of a person knowingly sinning against God without any urgency to get rid of that sin. We're coddling it. We're tolerating it. We're accepting it. And the psalmist says, if you're tolerating the sin in your life, the Lord himself was not going to hear you. So if we're tolerating it, if we're coddling it, if we're, if we're, in, if we're cherishing it, if it's something we feel like God... I've heard people so many times, and listen, and I've been in ministry several years, I hear people say, it's the one thing I do. You know, <laughs> I don't do this, I don't do that, I'm not a bad person, but I really like doing this. Boy, I can't get no help in this Pentecostal Holy Ghost Church. But I really like this. I give everything else up but this. And I'm holding on to it. So we are aware. I'm, I'm just giving you examples. I'm only throwing things out to you to think about, food for thought. So when we think about a prayer, we think about the Lord himself will not hear you. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, and I'll paraphrase, God wants to answer our prayers, but sometimes cannot. Behold, here's what he said, Behold, the Lord is at hand, and his hand is not short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. I'm just, I'm kind of paraphrasing that for you to let you know basically what Isaiah is saying here. That, uh, behold, the Lord's hand's not short. It's not that he can't reach us. His ear's not going deaf that he can't hear us pray. But there is something in your heart. There's something. David said, I will not, I will, I will hide the word in my heart that I might not what? sin against God. I hide the word in my heart. I keep Jesus in my heart. I keep the word in my heart constantly. I, I, I'm aware of the fact that I'm a child of God, that I belong to the King, that I am a, a chosen vessel, that He is my Lord and my Savior. He didn't just save me, but He's the master of my life. He is everything, my Savior and everything. So I have to understand that. But when I let things in my life or in my heart that should not be there, it brings a wall of separation. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear you. Isaiah very clearly teaches us that sin separates us from God until He will not hear or answer our prayer. Now, again, I emphasize the word tolerated, fondled, accepted, known sin in our life. I'm talking about sin that we do not want to let go of. 
I'm talking about sin that we fondle, sin that we've accepted, sin that we tolerate, things that we like, things that we don't want to, to give up. And so when we do that, we foster this wall, we build this, this temper. This is what the Word of God is telling us, that these things will separate us from God. And so until it's repented of, until it's made right, until it's dealt with, how many knows it's a hindrance to your prayer life? Now, nobody wants to admit that tonight, but how much it is a hindrance? It's not that God can't hear your prayer. It's that God doesn't acknowledge it. It's not that God's deaf and He can't hear you pray when you pray. It's just that He can't acknowledge it when He knows there are things that are separating you and Him. There are things that you've not dealt with and that He wants to deal with. He wants to help you. So when we reemphasize the word uh, tolerated or accepted or known sin in our life, so that's what I mean by realization of this word unconfessed sin. When we realize it, when we recognize it, but it's hidden away in our heart. Uh, we did, uh, I, one of these days I'm going to preach this message again, but I used Stephen one time, we, we talked about, I gave him some cards and, and during the message and I asked him to give me those and he held them, he gave them all back but one. And he, he would not let me have that card. And it was symbolic of a sin in his life that he just did not want to let go of. And it was all a, 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 a message, of a, an, an illustrated sermon about how that we want to give God everything, but then there's something we want to hold on to. And so God is saying that has to be dealt with. And so this is where we're at tonight. That could be a possibility. That may be the reason your prayer is not answered. I'm giving you 10 roadblocks that are responsible for unanswered prayer. So when you think about it, uh, I pray, before I pray for a change in circumstances, I should pray for a change in character. <laughs> so instead of me praying for you to change, or for you to change, or for my circumstances to change, how many knows I need to pray for me to change? Amen. God, change me. Amen? Amen? God, change me. Deal with me. Change my heart. Change me, God. Then we can deal with the other stuff. Before I ask God to rearrange my life, I should ask God to rearrange me. Amen. How many of you have ever prayed, and please don't raise your hand, pray that God would change somebody else? <laughs> I can't get along with this individual. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I just pray. God, change them. <laughs> I just want to see. I think God smirks sometimes. You're the one I need to change. Because if I change, then it really doesn't matter anymore. Because now, my motive is not to change them as much as my motive in my heart is, in, is pure that I want to be right before God, that I can help others. So it's not about, Lord, changing. Uh, before I ask God to rearrange my life, I should ask Him to rearrange me. All successful prayer begins with confession of any known sin in our life. At that moment, we confess that sin that opens up the channel of God can begin to work through us. James teaches us in James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous man. How many of those prevails much? The prayer of a righteous man avails much. Is that true? Is that what the Word of God says? So the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So we find out a man who has been made right by the cleansing action and the confession of his sins, the prayer of a righteous man has great power and is effective. His prayers avail much when we have a right standing with God. When the breakers in the house are working, when all the wires are connected in the house, when everything is working properly, when the power comes through, then the house Works. Every TV, every refrigerator, every device in the house is back online. Everything's working because what was stopping that is fixed, that one little problem. And it doesn't take a lot. How many knows to stop something? Amen. Well, it don't take much. Just a blown, how many knows a breaker can, Amen. just something simple, a wire chewed in two, a wire that's broken. How many knows can cause chaos in the house? So we understand that. We understand that meta more. Uh, so when we, when we speak in this terminology, in these terms, it's, help, it's easier for us to understand what God is saying when I bring it home to you like that, into your home. It's easier for you to process what God is trying to say to us tonight. That God loves us. He cares about us. He wants us restored. Norman Vincent Peale tells a story about when he was a kid, he found a cigar. 
He went to the alley and lit it. And of course, he didn't like it at all, but it gave him such a feeling of importance. He's a young man, young boy. He's puffing away on this cigar when his dad happened down the alley. Peel immediately put the cigar behind his back and tried to carry on a normal conversation. So he's hiding the cigar behind his back. And so he tries to distract his dad. He said, look at that billboard over there, the fair or something. You know, he's trying to distract him. But his dad said, Norman, you need to learn something. You don't make requests when you have smoldering disobedience behind your back. He distracted his dad by saying, there's a circus coming to town. Look at that sign. And his dad said, you're not going to get requests answered when you have smoldering disobedience behind your back. It was just a story of one man's illustration of life. When things are not going right, when things are not, when we have things in our life behind our back. Have you ever done that? It's a little silly, but have you ever tried to divert God's attention? You're trying to get through to Him, but God's trying to deal with the smoldering disobedience in our life. I mean, as we're trying to get God to answer our prayer, we're trying to get God to do what we want Him to do, but how many knows there's this little issue over here that all we got to do is take care of that and everything else will be all right? And so it's, it, 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 it's a smoke screen. It's a, it is a, it's a smoldering disobedience that we don't want to deal with, and so we try to hide it. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden. How many knows Adam and Eve ran and hid from God as if they could hide from God? And they made them clothes out of figs, leaves, and covered themselves. And God said, where are you, Adam? As if he didn't know. What are you doing, Adam? Where you at? Normally about this time of day, you're waiting on me to come and talk to you. Now you're hiding from me. Where you at? I hid from you, God, because I was naked. Who told you he was naked? I ate of that tree I wasn't supposed to. So it causes problems. It creates more problems when we don't deal with what's going on right in front of us. Number two, an unforgiving spirit. How many knows this is a big one? Yes. Unforgiving spirit. How many knows, I want to say his name. Um, my mind just is not bringing these people to, to mind. But uh, one man has said that more people will be in hell because of unforgiveness than any other sin. Just could not let go. You say, well, that's awful harsh, preacher. Well, I, do you want me to go back to the Scripture? For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. I know we don't want to hear that. I'm not being, I, I'm, I'm being honest. It, it's one of the most difficult things to be wronged, to be, I have been, listen, I have been hurt so many times that I'd be ashamed to take, I'd be ashamed for you to let you see the scars on my body. You couldn't see them anyway. Amen. Stab, cut, hurt, and I can tell you every person in this building has felt the pain of rejection, betrayal, hurt, bitterness. Someone has hurt you. I promise you, there's not one person in this church that has not been hurt by someone. So it's difficult. It's a, it's a touchy subject. An unforgiving spirit. Have you noticed in the Gospels how many times Jesus connects forgiveness with answered prayer? In Matthew chapter 18, remember when Peter came to him and asked how often should he forgive another person? You know, Peter's, he's really feeling proud right, right now. He's really feeling good. He's going to throw out a number there. He says, seven times, Lord, because the law only says three times. So he's more than doubling this. So he says, how often should we forgive another person? Peter says, should I forgive seven times now? That's over twice what the Hebrew law would command, to forgive a man three times for the same sin. And we know what the Lord did. He looked right back at him and said, yes, 70 times seven. You got part of it right, Peter. But you left the 70 off in front of the seven. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody does something to me 490 times, I've got some issues. <laughs> oh, y'all been there. 
But who's counting? 490 times? Same thing? It's what the Lord said. I'm just, I didn't write this gospel. 490 times. For every, the very same sin. Jesus is trying to teach Peter that forgiveness is not mathematics. That forgiveness is not about mathematics or keeping score. Or if we all had, how many of us could, have, could show our scorecards tonight? <laughs> well, praise God, nobody has a scorecard. How many of you still have a problem telling the truth? We could all show our scars. We could all talk about pain and hurt tonight and unforgiveness and bitterness and deceit. He's trying to teach Peter that an unforgiving spirit is not an act, but it's an attitude. Jesus is saying that unforgiveness is not about mathematics. Forgiving spirit is not an act, but it's an attitude. It's not, listen, it's a lifestyle. If you're going to be a Christian and you're going to be in the ministry, I found out a long time ago, if I'm going to survive in ministry, forgiveness is a lifestyle. Amen. And three of you said amen. If you're going to be a Christian and you're going to be in ministry and you're going to love people and love Jesus, forgiveness is going to be a part of your lifestyle. It's just there. It's something we exercise all the time. So he's teaching us. He's teaching Peter. Jesus says that when you come to the altar to pray and talk to God, think of something wrong between ourselves and someone else. We're to leave that altar, go and restore the relationship with the brother or sister, and then come back and bring our gift to the altar, and then it will be accepted. You see, when you have a, a forgiving spirit, it not only makes your prayer life more effective, but it also makes your heart more light. Because when your heart is Light, your heart is right. And when your heart is right, your heart is light. Amen? Amen. I mean, it's like a ton of bricks. It's like, it's like a whole weight of the world is lifted off your shoulders. And you know, I can't make you forgive me, but I'm not responsible for you. I'm only responsible for me. See, the good news is I can't make you do anything, but I can control my own attitude and emotions. That's the part that's difficult. Because it's not fair, God. It's not fair, Lord. It's not right. It's not fair. Well, here's the deal. When it gets to a point to where we can be like that, and we ever get to a point, that's, 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 that's being like Christ. That's modeling Christ. So we think about it. Because when your heart's right, your heart's light, and you become effective in your prayer life and your walk. Our relationship with others must be right before our relationship can be right with Father. Jesus said, God said in little John, how can you say you love me and not love? How can you say you love me whom you have not seen and not love those who you have seen? Do you know Jesus died for those? Do you know Jesus died for my enemies? Do you know Jesus died for people who don't like me? And I don't know why, but he did. I do know why. I'm just trying to make you understand that he died for people, everybody, everyone. And so here's the deal. Our relationship with others must be right before our relationship can be right with the Father. If it's possible for you to have an effective prayer life and pray around disagreements and problems and relationship difficulties, it's impossible. For you have effective prayer life and play and pray around disagreements and problems and relationship difficulties. Number three, moving quickly, an unsurrendered will. Another roadblock to prayer is an unsurrendered will. James 4.3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. You ask amiss. You're not asking in the right motive. You're, you're asking wrong. You're not asking right. He's talking about the motive of our prayer. How many knows our prayer motives can be wrong? How many knows what I'm talking about? Motives doesn't always line up. You know, we, we pray a nice prayer and we want something, but sometimes motive gets in the way and it kind of it takes away from what we're trying to do here tonight. You do not receive. He's talking about a motive of our prayer. When we pray, he's saying that when our motive's wrong, 
often the answer does not come as we want it to. I have seen people who are very genuine in their prayer life had motives that were not quite as pure as they should be before God to effectively answer that prayer. So if our motives is not right, I mean, that, that changes everything. If our motives is, you know, you, you give somebody something, but if you're given to be seen, that changes everything. Right? The Bible says not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, or it talks about it means that some things your reward is in heaven, that it will be rewarded at that time. So, again, we're talking about an unsurrendered will. Here's the principle. We ask and do not receive because we ask wrongly. I've known, listen, there are wives that pray for their unsaved husbands. If they were truly honest, they would say they are praying their husband's salvation so their life would be easier at home. Now, before you get mad, I think that's a legitimate request. Nothing wrong with that. It's legitimate. But probably the motive isn't as pure as just praying because we don't want this person to die and go to hell. Does that make sense? So we can pray. Our motive can get involved in our prayer life. Can get involved. In, it can become selfish. It can be more about easy for me, more about me than it is for the individual. You know, uh, save this individual so my life's easier. You know, or so it makes my life better. Well, what about that soul? My mentor, Mitch Clinton, one time said. A man had been beating up on his wife, been mistreating her horribly, and she had confided in the pastor. A man calls him one night and says, I want to be saved. I'm sorry for what I've done. And at that moment, Brother Clinton, if I recall right, said that it made him angry. It bothered him human. I mean, it was the human side of us. That human side. Now, if I didn't tell that exactly the way it was, forgive me, but that you get the gist of it. And the Lord said, oh, how can you going to tell me who I can save and who I can't save now? You know, it's pain. Listen, ministry is painful. I, can I just be blunt? Being a Christian sometimes can bring pain. But you know what? Paul said, I reckon the sufferings in this life are not to be paired with what I'm going to get when I get to heaven. All this stuff's going to be forgotten about. When the dust clears and the smoke settles, we're going to be with Jesus forever in eternity. I don't think I've suffered hardly at all when I read about the Apostle Paul. They beat him. They whipped him. They stripped his back. They beat him with 39 stripes. They beat him with rods three times or so. They intended for the man never to walk again. So I think about how he looked at Silas one night in jail and said, let's sing a song. That would have ticked me off. <laughs> if you sing, Paul, you'll sing by yourself tonight. Now, I'm, uns I'm just, I know that's my flesh kicking in. But I would like to think that it would have been nice. Lord, if I'm ever in that situation... Help me to respond the way that he did. Lord, let's sing. Let's sing. You know what God did? He sent an earthquake. And you know what he did? He saved the jailer that whipped him. And the jailer had to pull out a pan of water and wash the stripes off Paul's back that he put on him to start with. Oh, my. I'm still preaching for those that just tuning in. Unsurrendered will. We ask and we do not receive because we ask wrongly. I know... There's times we ask because our motive's not always pure. Now, this concept becomes a little more difficult when we engage in intercessory prayer because we're dealing with the wills. We're dealing with two wills now. If we're praying for an individual, we're dealing with two wills, correct? If I'm praying for you, if I'm praying for a situation somebody asked me to pray about, this can get a little difficult here because we're dealing with two wills. We're dealing with our will as we pray to God concerning someone else. But also we're dealing with another person's will. The unsaved, the unrepentant will. Our will may be totally surrendered and submissive, but we're praying for someone else who has a stubborn, rebellious, sinful will. And so the prayer at times becomes not as effective as it should be because of the unsur unsurrendered, unsubmissive will on the other side. So 
When you don't get that prayer answered, you're praying for uncle, you're praying for your uh, a cousin, you're praying for an employee, you're praying for a boss, you're praying for a family member across the, you're praying for somebody to be saved, and they're having and they and they have a, a a sinful lifestyle, and they have a sinful, they're doing things that they, they, they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Now you're praying your will, but you're also praying for their will, and how many knows their will is not always going to be cooperative. So we have to understand that. We have to give time to God. We have to give God time to work on an individual. Have you stopped to think what it really means when we say in Jesus' name? Basically, what we're saying is, Lord, we pray this in your name because we really don't know how to pray. The Bible says we don't know how to pray as we ought to. But the Spirit knows how to pray through us and can pray. So we don't really know how to pray. it. How many of you have ever been asked to pray about something and really didn't know how to pray about the situation? Anybody in here? I've had, I've had some people, listen, ask me to pray about some things that I'm telling you what, I could not believe my ears. You want me to pray about what? <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm thinking. We do know, we don't know how to pray, we don't know how to ask or say the right things at times. And so the Lord, we leave this up to you. We give you our human prayer and we ask that in Jesus' name so that you can sift through it, the wrong priorities, and get right down to the issue and meet the need according to your will and your plan. I mean, as God can sift through all that stuff. All of those unanswered things we have, those questions we have, those, the, all of that sin that is, that is in that individual's life that we don't even know about. How many knows God can sift through that and God can answer that, but it's, it has to be dealt with an unsurrendered will. I'm running out of time. But tonight, I want to tell you something. There are a lot of reasons that our prayers could be hindered tonight. A lot of reasons. We don't, it's not that God's mad at us. It's not that God doesn't want to answer our prayers. It's not that at all. But how many knows when there's an issue, when there's something on our end that has to be fixed and dealt with so God can deal with the whole picture? Amen. Remember, no power is going to be restored to your house till you get the problem in the house fixed. Correct? You're an isolated case. You're all alone. Everybody else has power. <laughs> Everybody else in the church is shouting, Lord, but me. Everybody else is having a good time, Jesus, but me. Everybody else is just, they're getting everything they want, Lord, but me. Could be some problems. I don't know. I'm not accusing. I'm not being accusatory. I'm saying these are things that will block and hinder when we begin to pray and ask God to move in our situation. So let's have a pure heart and let's trust God. Let's bow our heads tonight. I'm, I wasn't able to get through 